Hello, my name is Courtney Payne, Associate Editor at ASHRAE Journal. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, part of the ASHRAE Journal Supplier Webinar Series. The series provides information of interest to ASHRAE Journal readers and others about products and technology of interest to industry professionals. ASHRAE does not review supplier webinar presentations. The following presentation has been prepared by Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US on the subject Utility Incentives driving tomorrow's energy-efficient infrastructure. Today's speakers from Mitsubishi Electric are James DeBerry, Commercial Marketing Manager, and Kevin Master, Manager, Utility and Efficiency Programs. James develops and executes marketing plans for Mitsubishi Electric's commercial new product launches and existing product maintenance. With extensive corporate marketing experience, James most recently served as Senior Marketing Manager at AT&T Atlanta. He is a graduate of the University of Georgia with a degree in journalism. Kevin DeMaster joined, joined Mitsubishi in 2014 to consult on utility program designs and to advance innovative products in the marketplace that re revolutionize residential and commercial heating and cooling with inverter-driven BRF technologies. He has 10 plus years <clears throat> focused experience delivering effective solutions with substantial energy savings achieved in the public se sector. James, the microphone is all yours. All right, thank you, Courtney. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we'll be discussing utility incentives driving tomorrow's energy efficient infrastructure. On behalf of Kevin DeMaster, I'd like to thank you again for the time you've chosen to invest in today's session, and we believe you'll find the content presented to be quite valuable. We're planning to spend the next hour discussing utility incentives and some of the trends we're seeing in the changing marketplace. We'll also present an overview of VRF technology or variable refrigerant flow and explore some solutions on how VRF can support utility incentive programs. Specifically, here are some of the topics we'll talk about in the learning objectives for today's webinar. Learn how Learn why utility companies offer incentives in response to energy reduction mandates. Understand how utility incentive programs work and what challenges and opportunities they introduce for HVAC professionals. Understand variable refrigerant flow technology and how these systems create opportunities for incentives and rebates. And lastly, understand how manufacturers are supporting utilities in energy reduction efforts. Kevin and I look forward to sharing our thoughts on these incentive opportunities, along with a look at a couple of successful case studies, and we'll share some additional resources for continued learning at the end of the presentation. We'll have time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible, so be sure to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function within the presentation software. With that, I'll turn it over to Kevin, who will begin our discussion on some changing market trends. Kevin? Thanks, James. Um, you know, first of all, as we look at, when we look at the, you know, current landscape, there's several megatrends that rise to the surface that are focused on the needs of the marketplace. These big factors are leading to change in the energy sector and energy efficiency of equipment. Our market has changed in so many ways over the last few years, and renewable energy is hitting record levels due to demands by consumers and major industries. We see this represented today by major companies and their commitments to reduce their carbon footprint. In 2019, Forbes listed 101 major companies across all sectors, all of brands we know and use that have made these commitments. Much of this is centered around terminology you should become familiar with. It's called strategic electrification, which aims to decarbonize the atmosphere reduce pollution, and ultimately reduce the costs of modern comfort and technology by electrifying our commercial buildings, homes, and transportation, empowering these end uses with renewable sources, example like solar and wind, hydroelectric. The primary components of strategic electrification are to increase energy efficiency, move towards electric-powered appliances, water heating, HVAC, and transportation, and decarbonizing the electric grid through renewable energy solutions. We already know that consumers are demanding energy 
efficiency, the energy efficiency at the residential level, and they expect the same energy efficiency for commercial built environment. In addition to appeasing consumer demand, decision makers such as commercial building owners and facility managers are making choices for energy efficient systems to meet increasingly strict codes keep within their operational budget and contribute to sustainable practices. For owners, there's a focused attention to reduce their fossil fuel use, both in electric generation, as well as the end use technologies in buildings. Policies in some regions of the country are actually demanding changes that will mandate change to commercial building carbon footprint and apply penalties to non-compliance. Other regions of the country are going as far as creating natural gas bans for new construction. Strategies to attract and retain tenants, as well as manage energy costs and comfort, have decision makers demanding better control through energy monitoring and the use of phone and tablet apps. The idea of building decarbonization is of a primary focus as buildings account for nearly 40% of annual global carbon dioxide emissions. CO2, which absorbs and re-emits heat, is a necessary greenhouse gas. But the scientists have communicated that excessive amounts emitted by fossil burning technologies is raising Earth's temperature and changing our environment in addition to negatively impacting air quality with particulates and emissions other than CO2. Therefore, reducing energy loads, saving energy, and reducing the use of fossil fuel burning equipment are the most effective ways to reduce the carbon footprint of buildings. In response to this challenge, a number of public and private entities have committed to decarbonizing the built environment and constructing more sustainable buildings. We've seen a mix of voluntary and required pathways to greater sustainability. From a voluntary perspective, we see increased adoption of LEED and things like passive house programs, as well as incentives that are stretched or reach codes to build homes above code. From a mandatory perspective, there are several legislation, codes, and standards, such as the California Energy Strategic Plan and its net zero mandate, which began in 2020, where new homes in California must be net zero energy, therefore requiring all new homes to have solar systems to help achieve that. Governor Brown's executive order called for economy-wide carbon neutrality by 2045, noting that only 16% of that goal is accomplished through clean power. Several California cities, namely Berkeley, Menlo Park, San Jose, and Santa Rosa, to name a few, have banned the use of natural gas equipment in new construction buildings as of January 2020. Many examples exist outside of California that show very aggressive goals towards decarbonization. As we move east across the country, we can see Ann Arbor, Michigan plans to decarbonize by 2030 under their A20 plan. New York, under Local Law 97, will put stiff fines on 50,000 of their largest buildings if they do not meet the 80% carbon reduction goals by 2024. Also, on the supply side, we have collaboration happening between service providers in Massachusetts. The utilities participating in the MassSave Collaborative announced incentives and assistance to encourage and support builders and developers in the construction of multifamily high-rise buildings that satisfy requirements for passive health certification or a similar level of sustainability. The goal here is to create a healthier, more energy efficient, cost effective, and durable buildings. Whether through new construction or retrofits, utility companies are offering programs, incentives, and rebates for building owners who adopt energy efficient mechanical systems. With heating, cooling, and ventilation taking up about 40% of energy use per commercial building, variable refrigerant flow, or VRF, zoning technology has become an industry-preferred system. Before we walk through the incentives, 
Let's overview VRF so you have some background on the technology. James? All right, thanks for that information, Kevin. I would like to spend some time talking more about variable refrigerant flow technology and how it can help solve some of the challenges in today's marketplace. Variable refrigerant flow technology was introduced in the United States over 15 years ago after many decades of prominence throughout the rest of the world. In fact, in some parts of the world, VRF accounts for over 70% of the HVAC market. Instead of moving conditioned air through ductwork to the space requiring conditioning, whether it's heating or cooling, VRF delivers conditioned refrigerant directly to that space, eliminating the requirement for long runs of ductwork instead by using small diameter piping. This eliminates the inefficiencies that come with moving conditioned air a long distance through ducts and provides a more energy efficient, quiet, and flexible way to condition a space. VRF systems are electric powered and don't require fossil fuel combustion. VRF systems can be applied in two configurations, air source and water source. Air source systems use air as the heat transfer medium, expelling rejected heat into the air outside of a building. Water source systems use water as the heat transfer medium, expelling rejected heat into a water source typically located inside the building. Both configurations, air and water, maximize energy efficiency. Finally, due to, due to the design flexibility of VRF, it can be applied to a variety of building types and applications. In hotels, office buildings, and any facility where, small, where some zones will require heating while others require cooling, we typically install a heat recovery VRF system that uses a branch circuit controller to provide simultaneous heating and cooling. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but first, let's talk about the differences between a heat pump and a heat recovery system. At its most basic, a VRF system consists of an outdoor unit and a network of indoor units connected by refrigerant lines and governed by controls and sensors. What you see here is an outdoor unit on the left and a collection of indoor units on the right, again, connected by means of the refrigerant piping. Outdoor units may be used on their own as a single module like you see here, or twinned or combined together to increase capacity to achieve the building's conditioning requirements. The indoor units are available in multiple styles, which increases the application flexibility of the technology. These could be ceiling mounted like you see on the top here, or floor or wall mounted like you see below. Indoor units can either be ductless, which means the requirement for ductwork is eliminated, or ducted, which incorporates short run ductwork from the unit into the space requiring conditioning. You can connect up to 50 indoor units per outdoor unit. I would say that's probably not the typical scenario, but each large outdoor unit does have the capability to connect up to 50 indoor units. Now with heat pumps, indoor units are either in all cooling mode or all heating mode. So this example shows all the units in cooling mode. Here we show the units in all heating mode because again, you can only heat or cool at one time, not both. A good use of a heat pump might be in situations where you don't have varying thermal needs. One example might be an auditorium. You don't really need to simultaneously heat and cool this single space, so you would opt to either heat or cool the area. For example, if it's warm outside and the auditorium is full, you'd need to cool the entire area. If it's cold outside and only a few people in the room, you'd need to heat the entire area. So again, here in this example, you're seeing the units in all heating mode. With a heat recovery system, now this does allow you to simultaneously heat and cool different zones within a building. So here again, you can see the outdoor unit on the left, again connected to a variety of indoor units. But you can also see with the depiction of the blue and red lines that some areas are in heating mode, being the red, and some are utilizing cooling, being the blue. So how does this work? This is accomplished with the use of the branch circuit controller, which I briefly mentioned earlier, or the BC controller as we call it, which is the unit you see there just to the left of center. 
One way to look at the BC controller is like a quarterback or a decision maker. By using a liquid gas separator, the BC controller separates the refrigerant so that some areas are cool and some are heated. So each, or, so each area or zone has its own indoor unit that provides heating and cooling. An example of this might be a building with a lot of exposed glass. When the sun comes up in the morning and hits one side of the building, that heat generated by the sun against the glass might require for zones on that side of the building to be cooled. But on the other side of the building, which might still be in shade, it might be necessary to heat those areas. Let's talk a little more about how VRF systems work. Conventional systems use a fixed speed compressor, which cycles the unit on and off whenever the room dips below desired temperatures. That's depicted by the gray line here. This type of system relies on an all or nothing philosophy with the compressor running at either zero or 100%. This demands maximum energy input each time the system starts. Every time the system turns on, energy consumption spikes. When the system turns off, the set point temperature drifts and is no longer maintained. This can lead to unpleasant temperature swings as the system strains to maintain a constant temperature. Now with VRF systems, they can provide more precise comfort using less energy at the same time. So again, how does this system do this? This is achieved with the inverter-driven compressor. Inverter compressors are always running in the background, adjusting the compressor and modulating the speed in real time. That's represented by the green line here. By ramping up power to the compressor when needed, an inverter provides a more accurate on-demand approach to temperature control. If your room temperature is already a comfortable 72 degrees, for example, the inverter compressor may slow its engine to a crawl. On the other hand, if your room is really warm, say 82, 83 degrees, the inverter will push the compressor into high gear, reducing that temperature more quickly. This allows the system to more efficiently maintain the set point temperature without drift and energy consumption spikes. This is another source of energy savings as this eliminates the energy intensive start stop cycle of conventional HVAC systems. Another benefit of VRF is the ability for more precise zone control within a floor or building. Here you can see a floor plan depicted with an indoor unit installed in each area or zone. Compared to a centralized conventional system, a VRF system's indoor units are installed in each comfort zone within a building. Since the compressor can vary its speed and capacity, and the indoor units can vary their, their capacity, the system delivers the precise capacity needed to meet the load in each individual zone. Now let's talk a little bit about VRF performance in cold climates. Traditionally, conventional heat pumps didn't perform that well in colder climates. But modern VRF systems are capable of providing consistent comfort even in extreme temperatures. Systems perform in conditions from minus 31 degrees up to 115 degrees. We just re recently introduced a product using hyperheat technology, which is, with an en which is an enhanced compressor system that does deliver heat even when the temperature, outdoor temperatures get as low as minus 31. Modern VRF systems make strategic electrification achievable in cold climates for example, in areas like the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic where a large percentage of heating is provided by natural gas, propane, or heating oil. In the past, engineers and developers may have only considered those options in cold climate applications. VRF systems provide opportunities to save money and reduce CO2 emissions. Another benefit of VRF is the design flexibility. VRF systems maximize space. Again, they use small diameter piping to move conditioned refrigerant. This allows for smaller plenums and more open space for the interior of your building. VRF systems minimize mechanical space. Compared to conventional HVAC systems, VRF is very compact. 
Units are also dispersed rather than centralized, which reduces space requirements. VRF systems also require less structural support. VRF systems are 30% lighter than alternative systems, such as chilled water systems. This opens up opportunities for the roof to be repurposed to add a rooftop garden, restaurant, or perhaps some other amenities. VRF systems offer a wide variety of indoor unit options, including both ducted and ductless options, allowing for architectural flexibility. Another benefit of VRF systems is they operate at very quiet, whisper quiet levels. Here you can see some of the typical decibel levels of various activities like an office type environment to a typical conversation to even the noise levels that a vacuum cleaner or a garbage disposal might make. As you can see, some of the indoor units are quieter than a whisper level, which the whisper level comes in at 30 decibels. Uh, Mitsubishi Electric Train, HVAC, just recently launched a new series of wall-mounted units with some capacities producing sound levels as low as 22 decibels, again, quieter than even whisper levels. And again, as you can see here in the middle, even with some of the outdoor units, they have sound levels below 60 decibels, which is even lower than what a typical conversation might represent. With that, I'll turn the presentation back over to Kevin, who will talk about the efficient use of electricity with VRF systems. Kevin? Thanks, James. So as you know, James just discussed, the uh, VRF technology is uh, very friendly to the electric power grid as it makes very efficient use of electricity, hence the interest by utilities to incentivize their installation and use. With minimal electric waste, the precision of VRF system promotes a more sustainable built environment that meets the modern HVAC building needs for control, efficiency, and comfort. Again, as building owners seek to decarbonize their buildings, they do this through strategic, they're looking to do this through strategic electrification, and the solutions for that include power building systems with electricity, drawing electricity from cleaner grids and renewable sources, increasing energy efficiency, decarbonizing and reducing pollution, which ultimately reduces costs for customers and society. So in order to solve the building owner interests and policy mandates around this decarbonization strategy, HVAC solutions will have to move away from fossil fuel, which will likely require electric HVAC solutions. This chart represents the available product category options for business owners to consider when seeking electric HVAC technologies. As you can see, there are many variables one should consider when looking for solutions. The yellow cells in this chart indicate being top in their respective categories. Things to consider are what is product availability? What are things like heating efficiency, the capacity of equipment, their cold weather capabilities, and the ability to modulate and part load. As you can see outlined in this chart, the category to the right, the rightmost category VRF, is the one product technologies in which all these categories are met. As mentioned earlier, one of the megatrends is how the utility world sheds light on the whole energy efficiency and renewable conversation. Today's, the 21st century issues are focused on distributed generation, demand response, and a whole lot more. One thing that is consistent is change. Utility companies are transforming and changing their practices now as they look at the electric, electric generation of the future. Many studies are showing that renewable sources of energy is cheaper than current electric generating assets of coal and even natural gas. Utilities that do not change could be faced with lost assets on the books that no longer meet economic sense to operate and impact their shareholders. Beyond the financial impact, the younger generation and future customers of these utilities are demanding more sustainable solutions. As these grids get greener, 
the electric HVAC technologies become greener as well that collectively work to meet these decarbonization targets. As, sh as shared earlier, many of the states getting media attention typically are those on the East Coast, uh, on each coast of the US. However, you can see from this chart that the top 10 states make up 56% of building emissions. Note that six of these top 10 states are actually located in the middle of the country, and there are plenty of initiatives happening in states around the country to address the source of CO2 emissions. For the National Conference of State Legislature, state renewable energy requirements have driven roughly half of the growth in the U.S renewable energy generation since the early 2000s. At the same time as spending increases to generate renewable electricity, the demand side or energy that's used behind the meter is seeing record energy efficiency spending. These budgets for energy efficiency in North America is predicted to continue to grow significantly over the next decade. And according to Navigant, to nearly $11 billion a year. Regarding utility programs that are centered around ductless heat pumps and VRF systems, we are starting to see a double benefit. Annually, we see utilities adding more and more new heat pump programs to heavily promote this technology. And in some cases, we're even seeing a movement away from central AC systems and rebates that, that fund those. Additionally, a huge portion of that $11 billion is beginning to be transferred from former fossil fuel programs and being reallocated uh, re to things like heat pumps. Now that we know utilities must invest in energy efficiency, one way utilities are achieving this is by incentivizing consumers to use energy more efficiently by buying into these innovative technologies. An energy efficiency incentive is designed to help pay the range of incremental costs a developer or building owner might experience to influence their decision to purchase high efficient equipment versus standard efficiency. There are three main types of utility incentives which we'll overview next. Prescriptive rebates, midstream rebates, and custom incentive paths. One of the biggest barriers for heat pump technology is current policy issues around fuel switching for any of the incentive programs, sometimes limiting the ability to get incentives to convert from a fossil fuel heating solution to heat pumps. However, the good news is this is starting to change for mini split heat pumps where the technologies in some cases are exclusively allowing incentives for fuel switching in these applications. The hope is that this trend will transfer also to VRF in the near future as utilities measure and recognize the benefits of this technology. So let's ju dump in, jump into a few of these different uh, incentive solutions. So for prescriptive rebates, for heat pumps are more common in the residential market where a simple pre-approved amount per unit is given for the installation to a customer. So for example, a homeowner might get between a $200 and $2,000 rebate for installing a mini split HVAC system. Prescriptive rebates are not yet a common solution for utilities for large commercial VRF systems. Traditionally, they've been common with mature equipment such as chillers, boilers, etc. As VRF becomes a more commonly applied technology, there are opportunities to see this approach become more popular as it simplifies participation for building owners and installing contractors. Today, only a few utility programs have this type of model for VRF prescriptive rebates. Midstream rebates, which is really a form of prescriptive rebates, discounts equipment at the point of sale and the utility incentives go to the distributor, 
with the incentives flowing down to the end use customer through the sales process, depending on the design of these programs. This method of rebate is becoming more popular for some HVAC equipment. We are seeing residential mini split heat pumps moving to this approach as well, as some VRF midstream rebates are starting to emerge with the same concept. As utilities are rethinking the way they deliver their energy efficiency programs, this process is designed to increase adoption, higher adoption of high efficiency equipment, improve distributor equipment stocking practices for high efficiency equipment, as well as make it easier for installing contractors with an instant discount. Not to mention the fact that utilities are interested in reducing program administrative costs, directing more funds towards their incentives. The custom path, by and large, is the most common type of utility incentive for today's commercial building. In the absence of a utility having a VRF specific incentive, a developer or a building owner will work with the system manufacturer and utility company to determine the total incentive based on projected energy savings specific to that application and building. However, this process can be more involved and some barriers can exist in the various programs around the country, as some markets may require energy modeling requirements or struggle with defining some of the baselines for new constructions and retrofit. Each program has to answer the questions for themselves based on the individual utility and the Public Service Commission and the regulations behind the, the design of their programs. This also, in some cases around the country, can introduce some non-uniformity as well. However, there is great news in this story. There have been more programs emerging with VRF in the last year as a defined technology, and you in utility inquiries are exploding. Several programs have easier to use tools for their custom programs that do all the calculations and incentive estimation with very little investment of time. All investor-owned utilities in Texas have adopted this simplified approach. And Duke Energy, which operates in five states, uses a similar online tool for their custom program. Utilities are always seeking to overcome the barriers to achieve energy savings that are attributed to programs. Their objective is to find a balance between the ease in the process to participate in the program with the necessary policy requirements to have accountability for accurate and validated energy savings when using rate payer funds. For residential rebates, it's a pretty straightforward process, but not as simple for commercial buildings. The impacts of COVID-19 are also affecting the ability for some utilities to meet their energy savings goals. And in some cases, this is opening up more conversations on how to achieve energy targets utilities are accounted, accountable for annually by the Utility Commission. In several cases, within the last six months since COVID, incentives have increased 25 to 100 percent, but those that take advantage of the program will benefit the most. So Metis believes that we play a significant role supporting utility program objectives and educating the market for VRF. We do this by working directly with the utilities and state energy offices across the U.S. to educate them about air source heat pumps and VRF technologies and how it fits into their energy efficiency portfolios. I myself am part of Metis's utility team dedicated to focus on, on the complete supply chain. It starts with communicating program incentive opportunities to our sales teams that interact on the front line day to day with our distributors installing contractors, architects, and engineers to make sure incentives are considered to move projects forward. Our utilities team is focused on assisting utilities and the implementers to make wise decisions on the programs that are being designed. To that extent, we have gone as far as outlining points of conversation around best practice experiences we see with distributor and contractor community. We have a dedicated attention to identifying and promoting existing utilities 
by utilities that streamline the participation process and have incentives that will pique industry interest. For example, the references I just made to Duke Energy and the state of Texas. In many situations, we work to support our sales partners to advocate for allowance of internal tools we use that calculate energy savings and is accepted in several utility programs today. This include items such as the VRF energy estimator created by Wildan Group, an existing utility implementer, or the train trace tools that are very familiar in the industry. This relationship collaborating with utilities makes us a stronger industry partner, as well as creates a loyal and dedicated contractor community that values these benefits and set us apart as a manufacturer from the rest of the industry. Lastly, our continuously evolving technology has the industry looking to Metis to be a leader in products that solve the objectives of the marketplace as we discussed today. James is going to describe a bit more about the VRF technology solutions and application examples, as well as the opportunities with upcoming products next year that will further address decarbonization through heat pump water heating solutions for large buildings, which we are very excited to expand our solutions to transform the industry. James, back to you. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, as Kevin uh, mentioned and talked about, um, how Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC is advocating for rebates by working directly with utilities and state energy offices. And he also talked about uh, how we're working with implementers on program design. And we're also helping building owners navigate utility incentives and connect with program implementers, as well as providing education about heat pumps and VRF technology with classes at our training facilities all around the country. But in addition to those activities, as Kevin mentioned, I'd like to talk about some of the advancements in technology and efficiency when it comes to the equipment itself. Last year, we launched a new lineup of City Multi Outdoor Units. For the first time, we have a tiered product lineup with standard efficiency, high efficiency, and hyperheating models. We also recently launched 16, 18, and 20 ton large capacity single modules. Some of the other advancements are in our ventilation products. We, we recently released a new lineup of Lossnay Energy Recovery Ventilators, which remove stale air from the inside and bring in preconditioned air from the outside and help decrease the load on your HVAC system. On the control solution side, a new product called Building Connect Plus, which is a cloud-based integration tool, allows you to connect City Multi VRF equipment and third-party equipment under one simple-to-use interface. It gives you the ability to control and monitor up to 50 indoor units with all configurations done through a simple web portal, which really helps in managing light to medium commercial facilities. Some of the standard user-friendly features include alarming, scheduling, trend building, and the ability to view maintenance tool data all from a laptop or a computer. And in fact, since introducing this product earlier this year, Building Connect Plus has already been recognized with several HVAC industry awards, including one of the top money saving products for 2020. Outside of the HVAC specific products, I did want to share some information on an exciting new product we'll be launching next year, and Kevin did, uh, did touch on this earlier. And that is a new heat pump water heater. This water heater is designed to produce high volume hot water for commercial and industrial applications. Some typical applications would be for multifamily, for hotels, gyms, senior living, anywhere that calls for hot water when your guests or tenants need it. Now you can see from this diagram, we have the heat pump water heater on the left, which connects to a holding tank, tank and then it's piped in piping is in is piped in to deliver the water. Now these units can be combined together with multiple tanks to deliver large volumes of hot water. And because of some of the patented technology, we anticipate this product to have a high coefficient of performance, making it much more efficient than traditional electric water heaters. Some of the other features, this product also utilizes CO2, an environmentally friendly natural refrigerant 
which does not destroy the ozone layer and has significantly low global warming potential. By using CO2, this unit can contribute to the redu reduction of harmful emissions. Some of the other features include providing high temperature hot water up to 175 degrees, along with the ability to operate at low outdoor temperatures as low as minus 13 degrees. So again, this hot water heat pump is something we'll be looking to launch next year. We'll now turn our attention to a couple of successful applications where BRF technology has been used with rebate programs and to help promote strategic electrification. The first is the AC Marriott Hotel in Dublin, Ohio. Dublin, Ohio is home to the renowned Jack Nicklaus Memorial Golf Tournament and several Fortune 500 companies. Luxurious and sophisticated hospitality, hospitality was needed for pro golfers and those coming into town on business. Sustainability was important, so the developer was initially looking at a load-matching water source heat pump system. Mike McAmel, one of Mitsubishi Electric Train sales representatives, knew that he could save the developer a projected $100,000 annually through the combined utilities and maintenance savings of a BRF system. For that hotel, a water source heat pump system would have required a compressor bearing unit in every hotel room, plus more for the common areas. With the more efficient VRF system, the total tonnage was reduced due to increased system diversity. Ultimately, the number of compressors was reduced from 182 down to 19, and the total number of water pumps reduced from 190 down to 5. Now, to receive these rebates, the project team worked with a local utility company, American Electric Power, and their custom rebate program. A third-party energy modeling program was used to do a projection of energy usage. With American Electric Power's custom rebate program, they compare how much better the building's projected performance is compared to a baseline ASHRAE 90.1 building. American Electric Power pays $0.10 cents for the estimated first year's kilowatt hour and three cents per kilowatt hour to the HVAC designer. As you can see here, the developer received almost $45,000 in rebates and the engineer $13,500. For our next example, we want to discuss Minnesota Power, a regional utility company that is striving to decarbonize and offer incentives for their customers. They are also working with the state to help reduce their reliance on oil and natural gas. After seven years of failing compressors, humidity issues, frigid winters, a defective HVAC system in its Colquitt, Minnesota office had left the utility company at its wit's end. Very cold climate with low ambient design temperature of minus 20 but that design temperature was only achieved 1% of all hours within a given year. In addition to wanting to promote the effectiveness of variable refrigerant flow systems as a viable, cost-effective HVAC solution, Minnesota Power wanted to show their customers that the technology could perform in frigid winters, again with a low ambient design temperature of minus 20 degrees. To ensure performance in their climate, they selected City Multi BRF with H2I technology. According to the HVAC engineer, Zach Weir, the system kicks off at minus 25 degrees below zero and switches to auxiliary heat from there. Minnesota Power has baseboard electric auxiliary heat. The design team noted that the auxiliary heat will rarely run based on the design of this new BRF system. Since their office is also a training facility, Minnesota Power created a showcase using two indoor units inside one room to showcase the efficiency of simultaneous heating and cooling. The image here displaying the side-by-side -side controls is used for those demo indoor units. They are hoping more of their customers make the switch to an all-electric technology such as VRF.
So there are just a couple of examples of how VRF technology was used to promote rebate programs and energy efficiency. The takeaways from our presentation today, as we've discussed, the adoption of electric power heat pumps and VRF systems facilitates electrification in buildings. There is an increased demand for sustainability and decarbonization. Utility companies face energy efficiency mandates. They offer incentives and rebate programs to their customers to help meet these mandates. And lastly, electric powered variable refrigerant flow technology is an energy efficient system that can help achieve utility incentives. That concludes the prepared portion of today's webinar. Kevin and I enjoyed discussing some of the opportunities out there with utility company incentives, along with an overview of VRF technology and a couple of successful examples of how VRF can help save energy and save companies money with these rebates. We hope you found the information to be valuable and we look forward to answering your questions in just a few minutes. But first, we'd like to highlight a few resources, among many others, available for your use after this presentation concludes. These resources include our website, which you can see on the screen here, metahvac.com, M-E-T-A-H-V-A-C.com. There's also a link to find a VRF distributor to learn more about VRF. If you'd like to review these case studies that we talked about today or to explore other examples of case studies, Here's a link to our case study library. Um, we actually have over 150 case studies which, which cross a number of different types of applications from office buildings to schools to hotels to mixed use and many more. And lastly, a link to our quarterly engineer, architect, facility manager, and builder newsletters. On behalf of Kevin, thank you again for your time and attention today. With that, for questions and answers, I'll turn the presentation over to Andy, who will be our Q&A moderator for this portion of the webinar. Andy? Thank you, James. Thank you, Kevin. Great presentation. And we have quite a few questions, which range from questions about utility programs and VRF itself. So let's get started. For a commercial building, when do you typically have to start applying for incentives with a utility or for to obtain rebates? So th the question I think applies specifically to whether the, the program or the incentive is a prescriptive or custom. I'll quickly describe. A prescriptive uh, incentive or rebate, as I mentioned, is something that just gets paid on a per unit basis and those types of incentives are applied for after an install and usually those uh, rebate submittals must be in usually between anywhere between 30 and 60 days after installation. However, as described in the presentation, most of the programs for commercial buildings are going to rely on a custom program. Custom programs require pre-approval in, in those types of incentive applications. The reason for pre-approval is, is, a, is a, for a couple reasons. Number one, that the uh, utility can make sure that there's funding available and that they can reserve funding to uh, check um, the, the viability of the product solution of ERF application into a facility. And secondly, um, really to look at and do some calculations and analysis of the expected energy savings for the program. As, uh, as James described earlier, you know, the AEP Ohio program, for example, there's a fixed rate of energy uh, incentives per KWH saved for the annual savings. So in that case, it was a 10 cents per KWH saved. So um, in summary, custom programs need pre-approval and the process probably should start uh, I would say within a couple weeks to a month ahead of uh, a project getting started. And all projects, no equipment tip can be ordered before an incentive is approved. Okay, great. Um, right, so let's move on to the, to the next question. Uh, James, you have uh, an additional comment? 
Uh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> All right, great. So next question. Are there any regions where fuel switching is being incentivized through utilities? That's that's a great question, and um, there's a lot of movement towards um, the interest around fuel switching. A lot of these are still policy issues that the utility commissions are trying to struggle with because of the issues with moving um, uh, off of one type of fuel and so disadvantaging one utility and advantaging another utility. But there are examples where we've seen this happen, and ex where I would say this is happening predominantly is you see some of this happening in the Northeast. Uh, we've got some in, in California, you've, depending on the utility. Um, you know, SMUD, for example, will be one that is promoting. We know TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, is, is one that will allow and actually promote the switching. Most investor-owned utilities are not quite there yet. However, um, in the state of Illinois, the, uh, about two years ago, mini split heat pumps for residential application were allowed uh, for fuel switching. So they were allowed to participate in the incentives regardless of the fuel in the existing home. Um, the state of Wisconsin's midstream program just went that direction this last April. Um, and again, mini splits being the only technology that's allowed for fuel switching. And we're starting to see a lot more conversations happening around this, um, predominantly you know, throughout the country, but I'm, I'm hearing more of it in the Midwest even where, where things are not as progressive. So it's happening, it's starting to occur. Okay, fantastic. This next question, and actually it's part of a series of questions with regard to indoor air quality and ventilation. So. Here's the most basic question. How is outside air introduced into the building with VRF systems? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one, and if Kevin has anything uh, he wants to add. Um, I, I mean, we have, as I mentioned earlier, when we talked about some of the, uh, the technology advance, advancements in our equipment, we have a number, number of different ways to bring in fresh outside air. I mean, we have the, uh, the premises dedicated outdoor air system, which is a rooftop uh, ventilation product for um, for large commercial applications. Uh, we also have the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the LOSNA units, which, which uh, uh, bring in fresh air and eliminate the stale air from the inside. And then uh, lastly, we also introduced last year a ducted outside air unit, which is another, another way that we can uh, improve uh, indoor air quality by bringing in fresh air uh, that can be temperature controlled. I don't know if Kevin wants to add anything. No, I, I don't have any more to add. That's great, thanks. All right. Um, this next question is not about ventilation, but uh, still about what creating indoor air quality. So what levels of filtration are available with VRF? Well, I know, I know. Particularly with our with our Lossna units, uh, we are we are looking at a, at a series of standard as well as high efficiency type filters. And uh, in fact, we're looking to introduce a MERV uh, 16 filter uh, in the in the coming months. So that's that's something I think specifically for the uh, the Lossna unit that will be a a very high level of, of filter filtration with uh, the MERV 16 filter. Okay. Just one more question here. I want to ask about. The the uh, ventilation systems, but this one is related to incentives. So this person asks, has there been any discussion of incentives for the outdoor air systems used with VRF? Could incentives for those systems be combined, presumably uh, you know, DOAS and VRF? So uh, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at that. So. I mean, utilities vary in terms of the types of incentives they're going to offer and the types of technologies they're willing to incentivize. And I'm sure in many cases, I don't, I don't track a lot on the ventilation side, um, but I'm, I'm sure that there are uh, incentives in some markets for things that would incorporate things like heat recovery that are included in ventilation systems. Um, so, and, and I think a lot of times this evolves around also the controls that is modulating the amount of ventilation air that has to be conditioned. 
so those all become part of sometimes custom solutions that where energy savings can be uh, calculated and estimated on, on the impacts of the building. So that, that's my comments related to ventilation incentives. Okay. Next, I'm going to combine a few of these questions there. They're somewhat related. So a few have asked, so what kind of buildings can use VRF? Is there, there a sweet spot that's pretty representative? And another related one is, can VRF technology work across the country in, in different climates? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one, and then if Kevin wants to add anything. I mean, yeah, as, as we discussed um, earlier now, with we have a, the tiered product lineup, so I, I think pretty much even in the, the cold, cold climates of the, the Northeast, uh, with some of our hyperheating products, they can certainly work work well in the uh, in the the colder colder type climates. Um, and I, I think also with some of the introduction of our new indoor units that are much more energy efficient, I think those those can help uh, as well as um, you know I, I think it can definitely cross multiple applications. I mean we we've installed VRF systems in schools and high rise office buildings. I think they're uh, Certainly applicable for uh, the hotel environment over over using the package terminal uh, air units inside. Uh, so I, so yeah, I think there's a number of certainly a number of different applications um, that VRF is is certainly a a, a good fit for uh, across a broad a broad range of of lines. And again, if you go to the website, you can certainly check out a number of different application uses uh, of the VRF technology pretty much across uh, you know anything that you might be looking for. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add. I was going to say I'll just add to that. Just kind of reiterate um, what James was saying. The the top five uses we were just discussing this the other day with another program. Um, the top five applications we see for VRF is multifamily, um, hospitality, assisted living, K twelve office buildings, those type of applications, and. Just to reiterate, you know, the technology has emerged so so far that, you know, the real hurdles I think where VRF has improved the most is really the cold climate applications. So the more uh, advancements in the technology have really allowed us to be, you know, c approaching sole source heating in some of the coldest environments across the U.S. Um, we're not probably 100% in every state quite yet, but it's getting awfully cold, as, as James outlined in the performance capabilities, you know, down to negative 31 operation. So this next question, I know we're running up on time, and it's kind of a big question. <laughs> so but how would a utility get started if we wanted to create a VRF pilot program? So. Who would they contact? What would they do? How would they even, yeah. even begin? So, so, yeah, so this is an area where I've been working probably over the last year or two working with utilities that have been interested. You know, the things I like to do is, is share kind of some best practices, what we're seeing in various markets, and just lay out information. Here's what others are doing. Here's information. Here's the approach. So I guess I would say start with me as the point of contact. And hopefully, my, all my contact information is uh, is available on the slide deck. But um, we can certainly send that out, and you can contact me, Kevin D. Master, K. D. Master at hvac.mea.com. Okay, great. Let's see, two fifty nine. So, James, you want to us take one more or? I think we should uh, wrap it up. Your call. Uh, sure, we, sure, we can take one more. Sure. All right. Okay. So let me just—it's another uh, kind of a basic question, but uh, what are the differences between VRF and a multi-split system? Well, again, I think with VR, I'll let—I'll take the first shot at it, and I'll let Kevin answer. I, I think certainly with VRF systems, when we talked uh, earlier about the heat recovery systems. I mean, the great thing about uh, that system is you're able to install basically one one type system, and you're able to heat or cool simultaneously within the the same space. Uh, I know there's certainly some different limitations with with mini splits. I'm I'm not sure if Kevin's had much experience on that, but uh, you know, I, I th certainly think from my perspective, 
you know, the PRF technology, you know, as Kevin mentioned, has, has come a long way, and I think it's, uh, uh, you know, certainly a good application uh, for a number of different uh, office buildings and schools. And um, Kevin, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. I think just kind of in, in closing here, you know, some of it is a terminology issue. Um, the residential space and that equipment typically has just been coined with terms like ductless heat pump, mini split, multi split, multi zone, right? And so, uh, in that, in those being residential applications. So, a multi zone or a multi split in that scenario is likely going to be for a residential application and it's only going to have the options of heat pump. So, it can be in one phase or another, either heating mode or cooling mode. And the benefits of VRF, which I basically just describe as residential mini splits on steroids with a lot more capabilities, you know, you have enhanced features and capabilities on commercial grade equipment to do things like simultaneous heating and cooling that you don't have with a residential product. So, you know, they're all variable refrigerant flow in terms of how the equipment works using the inverter compressor. Um, so, in theory, multi-splits versus VRF, they're all variable refrigerant flow in how they operate. Excellent. Thank you. One more thing. Right. Uh, uh, Kevin, they asked, uh, we just got another question, which is very simple. Can you repeat your email address? Sure. K D E M A S T E R at H V A C dot M E A dot com. All right, perfect. All right, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Andy. That's all the time we have for today. Kevin and I, again, uh, appreciate everyone's time. We, again, we hope you found the information useful, and be, on behalf of uh, Ashbury Journal, thank you again for joining us, and have a great day.